in Acts chapter number 2, I want to focus your attention on verse number 36. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 36 reads, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's the title of the sermon this morning, both Lord and Christ. So I'm going to be preaching about prophecies from the Old Testament that were prophesying of the Messiah and wherein the truth was revealed even in the Old Testament scriptures that the Christ would indeed be God himself in human form, that the Christ would indeed be the Lord himself. This is not something that is exclusive to the New Testament. This is not a revelation that you know, people were unaware of or that was not a knowledge that was not attainable when you had the Old Testament scriptures, but rather this is found all throughout the Old Testament. Now, I want you to turn uh, with me, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16. We're going to look at two New Testament scriptures, and that should be it for the entirety of the sermon. Two New Testament scriptures. I want to look at two very clear New Testament scriptures on the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, the phrase, Lord Jesus Christ, that exact phrase is found in the New Testament 106 times. That is a lot. The Lord Jesus Christ is found 106 times in the New Testament. Let me say this. It is just an indisputable proof in the New Testament that Jesus is God. That is not something to be debated. It is extremely clear in the New Testament. 106 times we see this, this statement or this exact phrase in that exact order, Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to look at, with me to first or at 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16. It says this, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And then it says this, God was manifest. In the flesh. That is as clear as can possibly be. Go to 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 20. God was manifest or seen or made known in the flesh. Go to 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 20. 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 20. <coughs> it said this, and we know that the Son of God is come. And hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true. Now watch this. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. So notice that. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. Now look at this next sentence. This is the true God and eternal life. I mean, the Bible cannot be any clearer than that Amen. to express the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, even in his son, Jesus Christ, and it says, this is the true God and eternal life. Jesus Christ is the true God, the Amen. one and only true God. Now, uh, this sermon is going to be applicable to a few groups of people that could learn from this. Maybe people that are deceived. Maybe people that have been you know, grown up or raised up in a false religion. Some of those would be this. Jews. They claim that they believe the Old Testament, but they really don't even believe the Old Testament. They claim that they believe the Old Testament and they reject the New Testament. Then we have Muslims, right? We have you know, those that would subscribe to the religion of Islam. And then we also have people that would claim even to be Christians. And there are only a small few groups that would fall into this category. One would be Jehovah's Witnesses, of course. They say that Jesus is not the God of the Old Testament. He is not the Almighty God. He is not the Lord or Jehovah, right? And then you have, and this is even more fringe and more rare that you may not have even heard of them, but you have groups that refer to themselves as Restorationists. They have Restoration Fellowship, right? And uh, they go by, as far as theology goes, the term that's used to describe them are Unitarians. That's what they are referred to as. Now, this particular group is, is very rare. It's very, very rare. But all of these people have something in common. All of them reject Jesus as being God. Every last one of them reject Jesus as being the Lord. Now, uh, this sermon, as I said, would be more applicable to two groups. This would be applicable to those that subscribe to Judaism, which would be, you know, uh, Jews, right? 
and it would be applicable to those that say that they are Muslims or they say that they are, you know, they subscribe to Islam. The reason being because I'm going to spend this entire sermon in the Old Testament proving to you, proving to you that the Messiah to come is God himself. Now, both religions, Jews and Islam, reject that concept. That alone, once it's shown and it's obvious that the Messiah who's coming is going to be God, and you have two groups who adamantly reject that, that should be a red flag in your mind. When they claim, I believe the Old Testament, then you take them to the Old Testament and you can see it all throughout the Old Testament that the Messiah is going to be God himself, and they say, we don't believe that. Well, that should be right there, a big red flag in your mind that, hey, they don't even believe the Old Testament, do they? So we're going to begin here in Psalm chapter number 45, verse number 6. Psalm chapter number 45, verse number 6. The meat of the sermon, you know, 99% of the sermon, as I said, is going to be in the, in the Old Testament. I don't plan on turning to the New Testament. I may allude to some passages just because we know that Christianity is the one and only true religion. And just to, you know, to uh, help you better understand what we're talking about, the context of something, I may cite a verse in the New Testament here and there. But look here, we're going to begin in Psalm chapter number 45. And I want to begin in verse number 6. The Bible says this. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Now, let's say a Jew sits down to read this, right? Who do they say that, that, that this is speaking about, right? There's only one God, they say, right? There's only one God. You know, there's, you know, there's a, the God never was made flesh. It's just the one Jehovah in heaven. There's no distinctions of God becoming a man, nothing like that, right? They reject even what is considered the Catholic or Orthodox trinity of personages within, you know, the Godhead. And they reject that God will become a man at any time. Now, I want you to look at verse number 6, though. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Well, they would say, well, that's just Jehovah, right? And I agree with them. That's Jehovah. Well, look at verse number 7. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Thou lovest righteousness and hated wickedness. Now look at this. Therefore, God, thy God. Well, now we got a real big problem, don't we? Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, if you're a Jew, there's no explaining this verse away. Now, some people could look at this passage and say, well, that's teaching polytheism, right? Well, if you look at verse number 7, uh, there at the very end of the passage, it says this, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Once you keep your hand here, we're going to go to Psalm chapter number 2. Psalm chapter number 2. Is anybody aware of what the, what the word Messiah actually means? It's interchangeable with Christ, but does anybody know what it actually means? Anointed. What does it mean? Anointed. Anointed. So when we look here in Psalm chapter number 45, what he is speaking of is he is speaking of the man, Christ Jesus, who will be the anointed one, who will be the Christ or the Messiah. Look in Psalm chapter number 2. Look at verse number 1. It says this. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. Verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. And then it says this. And against his anointed. Now like I said, I'm going to reference a couple of verses just for your sake uh, that are in the New Testament. Acts chapter number 4 verse number 26. This verse is quoted. And it says the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord. And it says and against his Christ. Now that's not debated even with Jews, whether or not Psalm 2 is talking about the Messiah. They would even agree with that. They believe that Psalm 2 is talking about the Messiah. And we're going to be coming back to Psalm 2 in a minute to show that even in another area about the Messiah, they do not believe. They don't really believe the Old Testament scriptures. So when we see that the anointed is referring to who? The Messiah, the Christ. Who is the Messiah and who is the Christ in particular? It is specifically, and this is very, very important to understand, it is the man that would be born. Now, that man was God himself. But without that humanity, he is not the Christ and he is not 
the anointed. That is very important to understand because the Christ and the Messiah is he that would come of the seed of David. Right. He is he that was prophesied to come of the seed of David. So what does he need? He needs that flesh of David, doesn't he? He needs that flesh of that line of Judah. So without that, he is not the anointed. So we go back to Psalm chapter number 45. And we look there in verse number 6. We see, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Look at this too. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. What does that bring to mind? Doesn't that bring to mind maybe a king ruling, maybe the millennial reign, maybe the anointed reigning on earth? Look at verse number 7. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest iniquity. I'm sorry, wickedness. That's what's quoted in the New Testament. Hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God. And you're like, thy God? Yeah, the man Christ Jesus, God. Right. When you look at the New Testament, you know what you see Jesus doing all the time? He says to Mary that he's going to ascend to my God, and he says, and your God. And then he says, my Father and your Father. There's a lot that you can learn from just that right there. You see, we know by reading the New Testament as well, like 1 Corinthians 8, 6, that there's only one God, the Father. So that's why he uses God and Father interchangeable there. He says, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. That's one thing that you can learn from that, but also you learn this. The same way in which God was Mary's God, he was Jesus' God. And the same way in which he was Mary's father, he was Jesus' father. Related to what? What's the only thing they really have in common? Humanity. So you see, God, humanity, Father, humanity. Makes perfect sense. Amen. Here when you look at Psalm chapter number 45, another point of that is this. It says, therefore God, thy God. Talk about the man Christ Jesus, the anointed, you know, man, Christ, Messiah, God born as a man that would come. He says, thy God, watch this, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness. Now watch this further. Above thy, what? Fellows. What's that talking about? A man. Above thy fellows. The Bible talks about he's not ashamed to refer to us as brethren. Above thy fellows. That's why it says that he loved righteousness and hated wickedness or hated iniquity. Is, is, you know, God in heaven, of course, he loves righteousness, righteousness and hated, hates iniquity or hates wickedness. But is he praised or glorified for that necessarily? No, but it's a, it's a great feat or a great accomplishment when God as a man comes. And then he loves righteousness and hates iniquity and he lives that perfect precious, you know, our perfect sinless life, right? That's what this is referring to when it says that he loves righteousness and hates iniquity. And because of that, because of that, he's anointed, right? So now I want you to turn, let's go to another passage here. We're going to look at a lot of clear scriptures that teach, that teach that the Messiah will be God. Or the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament that he would be God. <laughs> Go to Isaiah. I want you to go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 7. And just to make sure you didn't miss it, miss it, just how clear it is. Again, I'm going to read you from Psalm 45, 6 and 7 again, all at one time. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. He says, Thou lovest righteousness. Talking about God. Thou is referring back to God from verse 6. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest iniquity. Therefore, God... Thy God hath anointed thee. So the anointed, the Messiah is who? God. Hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That's the Messiah being who? Being God. Very, very clear. I have a verse that actually says the Messiah is God. The anointed is, you know, the Messiah is the Christ. Here in Isaiah chapter number 7, verse number 14, the Bible says this. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And then it says this, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, in the New Testament, it actually tells us and interprets this for us right in the very same verse, or in the very next verse, I believe. But it does the same thing for us here. But it's in, excuse me, Isaiah chapter number 8, verse number 8. Look at Isaiah chapter number 8, verse number 8. And he shall pass through Judah, he shall overflow and go over, he shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land. Now what's it say? O Emmanuel, compare that to verse 10. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand. Now watch this. 
for God is with us. You know what the word Emmanuel actually means? God is with us. That's, that's, what, that's not debated. Yeah, that's what the, even you know, a, a Jew or a Hebrew would tell you what the word Emmanuel means. It is, the, it is the Hebrew word that actually means God is with us. Keep that in mind. We go back to verse 14 again. <clears throat> Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Now watch this. And shall call his name Emmanuel. What does that mean? They're calling his name God is with us. Process that for a few minutes. How do you get around the fact that this is God? It says that the man that's going to be born is going to be conceived of a virgin, and we're going to call him God is with us. Can you imagine that being applied to Moses? Can you imagine that being applied to any other just prophet of the Old Testament? Samuel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, giving him the name Emmanuel, it's like, what's your name? God is with us. That only makes sense if the Messiah or if the Christ is God himself. Why? Because he's conceived, he comes down, and he dwells among us. What does it mean? God is with us. He's living with us. How? Why? Because that man is God. Go to Isaiah chapter number 9. So right here within, all you have to do is just turn one page. How many pages is in your Bible? Some people maybe even just one page, right? One page. So Isaiah chapter number 7, verse number 14. Look at Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I want you to I want to keep reading here too, because I want you to show you verse 7 and prove to you that this is the Messiah or the anointed. Look at verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Now watch this. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth for, uh, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. There's no way out of this. I don't care if you're a Jew. It doesn't matter. This is speaking about the seed, the anointed Messiah that was going to be coming of the line of who? David. If you speak to a Jew today, what will they tell you? The Messiah is still coming and what seed is he of? What line is he of? What lineage? David, right? They claim that they believe that the Old Testament scriptures teach that the Messiah is coming of David. But they reject the concept that he that would come is God himself. Look at verse number six again. For unto us a child is born. Remember, this is he that's coming up the line of David, he that's going to be ruling with judgment and justice upon you know, uh, the throne and in that kingdom. A child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Look at this. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. When this man comes, you know what we're going to call him? The mighty God. Amen. Let that sit into your mind for a few minutes. You are going to look at this man and you're going to say, that is the mighty God. Right. How could you rationalize this any other way and try to get around this or sidestep the issue by saying, he's not really God, right. but we're just going to call him the mighty God. All throughout the Old Testament especially, people are called what they are. That's, it. That's what people are called. They were given names of what they were, how they acted. That's what they were called. You know, it'll say his name is called this because he has this characteristic. You know, she was called Eve. Why? Because she's the mother of all living. You know what Eve means? The mother of all living. I mean, is that hard? Do you know why he's called the mighty God? Because he's the mighty God. Right. It's consistent with all of the Old Testament. You flip over one page, Isaiah chapter number 7, verse number 14, and the Bible tells us that there is going to be a man that is born. He's going to be you know, a, a supernaturally conceived. He's going to be brought forth by a virgin, and we're going to call him God is with us. Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter number 9, this man is called the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Keep that in your mind there. I want you to flip over as a comparison. This is good to have for Jehovah's Witnesses. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 32. Jeremiah chapter number 32. Now, if you go to Revelation chapter number 1, in the beginning of Revelation chapter number 1, Jesus is speaking. 
Jehovah's Witnesses try to make it, uh, you know, Jehovah, which Jesus is Jehovah. They make that distinction, but they try to say it's Jehovah and not Jesus speaking. And Jesus says that he is the Almighty. Well, that's why they try to make that change, because they don't want Jesus to be God. They don't want him to be the Almighty. And if you take them to Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6, they are polytheists. They, and, and I've actually heard debates with Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, you know, loose Christians, liberal Christians, where, where this man actually, I believe his last name was Stafford. He's a representative of the Jehovah's Witness and the Watchtower Society. Joseph Stafford, I believe. But he debated James White, and he admitted, yeah, we believe in more than one God. You know, he didn't say it just like that, but he admitted that they believe in more than one God. You know, uh, in concept. Now, if you take them to Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6, they just say, well, Jesus is the mighty God when Jehovah is the almighty God. Right? Okay, well, I'm going to disprove that right now very simply, just in the Old Testament alone. So Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6 said that the son that was born, and they agreed this is Jesus, is referred to as what? The mighty God. Okay? Well, I want you to look at Jeremiah Chapter number 32, look at verse number 17. Ah, oh, Lord God! Now stop right there. Does everybody remember, right, when you look at Lord not being fully capitalized, and then the second word, God, being fully capitalized, capitalized do you remember what these two words are in order? This is Elohim Jehovah in Hebrew, right? So where God is right there, that is the word Jehovah. When you see the all capitalized God. So what we have here is Elohim Jehovah. So who is Jeremiah talking to? Ah, oh, Lord God! Jehovah. Behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Look at verse 18. Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompenses the, the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. Watch this. The great the what? The mighty God, the, look at that, Jehovah, that's Lord, the Lord of hosts is his name. Amen. That's Amen. exactly what it says Jesus' name is. It says that he shall be called, and it goes on, it says, the mighty God. Now we look at a passage where it's talking about Jehovah, and do you know what title is given to Jehovah? The mighty God. It's not, it's not only good for Jehovah's Witnesses. Do you know who else this is good for? <laughs> Jews. They claim to believe the Old Testament. And they say, well, yeah, you know, there's a Messiah that's coming, but he's just a normal man, just like me and you. He's just going to be a regular ruler, just a normal guy we call the mighty God, just a normal guy we call Emmanuel. God is with us. When you can take them to Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6, they confess, yeah, this is the Messiah. When they're calling him the mighty God, then you look up that title, and who is that referring to? Jehovah himself. Who is the mighty God? Jehovah. That's who's called the mighty God. What's, you know, what is the Bible teaching? Jehovah is that child that's born. Jehovah is that son that's given. It's the only way around it. And, and obviously, comparing scripture to scripture, it's, it's not a defendable position to say that Jesus is not Jehovah. Turn out of Micah chapter number 5, verse number 2. Micah chapter number 5, verse number 2. Micah chapter number 5, verse number 2. When Jesus was born, if you remember, the Pharisees, they recognized, those that even rejected that Jesus was the Christ, the Pharisees and the scribes, they recognized that Micah chapter number 5, verse number 2 was speaking about the Messiah. Because they were trying to determine, Herod wanted to know where the Messiah was, where he was going to be born, right? So they, uh, Herod got the scribes of the Jews and the, and the Pharisees to come in and tell them, hey, where is he going to be born, which is called Christ. Verse number two is what they, when they looked up and read, look what it says. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. There's no doubt that this is talking about the Messiah. Now watch this. Whose goings forth have been from of old. And then it says this. From everlasting. I want you to think for a minute. It's a very interesting thought that Herod sat down and he heard this read. 
All those scribes and all those Pharisees, they gathered together and they read this in the language that they were speaking at that time. They're communicating with Herod. They read it in Greek, I'm sure, right? They read this passage and they read the passage that said that the ruler that, that God was going to bring forth, which was the Messiah, the Christ, that his goings forth are what? From everlasting. That verse alone, this verse alone teaches and, and is indisputable that the Christ is the Lord, the God of the Old Testament himself. I, uh, Psalm chapter number 93, verse number 1, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it to you. It says this, the Lord reigneth, Jehovah. He is clothed with majesty, the Lord is clothed with strength. Wherewith he hath girded himself, the world also is established that it cannot be moved. Then it says this in verse 2. Thy throne is established of old. And then it says, thou art from everlasting. So it says, thy throne is established from old, thou art from everlasting. Micah 5, 2 again. Whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. That exact same language is used about only one person. Look it up. Where in the, in the Old Testament, where it talks about someone being from of old and from everlasting, because restorationists will try to say in, in Malachi chapter number 5, verse number 2, people that are Unitarians that say that it's only Jehovah, right, and, Jehovah, and Jesus is not Jehovah, they say when that is saying his goings forth are from of old, from everlasting, that that's just the plan of the Messiah to come. That's how they interpret John 1 like 1 is Pentecostal where it says, you know, it's just the plan in his mind of him to be born and that he didn't exist in any way, anything other than, you know, just being a thought. Jesus was not, you know, was, did not exist. He's not God himself. So they say that's what that means when it says, whose goings forth are from of old, saying this has been planned out from of old. And then it says, from everlasting. Well, the only time that language is ever used in the Old Testament, outside of Micah 5.2, is about Jehovah himself. And it says that his throne is established of old. And then it says, thou art from everlasting. You know what Micah 5.2 is talking about? Jehovah himself. Because he's from of old, from everlasting. So you can prove this multiple different angles. You know, when we see that the Messiah is said to be eternal or everlasting. What are we teaching? That he is God. There's only one that is eternal. There's only one that's everlasting. All right, I'm going to have you turn now to Psalm chapter number 110. Psalm chapter 110. Psalm chapter 110. Psalm chapter 110, it says this in verse number 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, if you remember, again, like I said, I'm going to allude to some passages in the New Testament. We won't necessarily turn to them, but Jesus, when he was talking about this passage with the scribes and the Pharisees, it was just common knowledge, and he knew that they would understand that this was speaking about who? The Christ. Because he asked them the question, how does he format the question? He says, uh, uh, it's hard to come up with stuff. If I was sitting in the pew, I'd be able to come up with it. Come on. If David then called him Lord, how was he then? I can't remember. Right, something along those lines. Right, right, yeah, yeah. He asked him the question, right, if David then called him Lord, how is he then his son? What sayest thou of Christ? You know, whose son is he, right? And then he, and then he quotes this passage and he says, is David... In spirit, I think he says even, or in, uh, under the Holy Ghost in some way like that, he says, if David calls him Lord, how is he then his son? So it was common knowledge that this passage was referring to who? The Christ. Everybody understood that. And who is the Christ? Lord. The Bible is extremely clear that there is only one God and that there is only one Lord. The Old Testament is extremely clear. And these particular people that I'm talking about this morning... You know, whether you want to talk about a Unitarian, whether you want to talk about a, specifically a Jehovah's Witness, a Muslim, you know, a Jew, these people are like, they try to, you know, em, you know, they emphasize this, don't they? That there's only one God. But they reject the concept that God became a man, right? Then how do you explain, if this isn't referring to that same Lord as a man, 
but you try to hold your position that is monotheistic, then explain Psalm 110 verse 1 to me. Because it plainly says, the Lord said unto my Lord. Do you know how Jesus understood that? It's that same Lord as a man. How is that? Because he explains how is, it, how is that possible, right? He's asking that question, and why can they not answer it? What's the reason? How is it that he come from him? And how is he calling him Lord? Why? Because he's the root and he's the offspring. Because he's that very Jehovah that's then born as a man that comes of the line of Jehovah. Because if you know what he's explaining? Why is David calling him Lord if he comes from him? Because he is God. That's the answer. Because he is who? Jehovah. Why is he David's Lord? That's a reference to who? The Messiah. The Christ. Who? The man. That same Lord as a man. See how every time what these point back to? And you see every time when you, when you have these statements that uh, uh, an Orthodox Trinitarian will try to make it into personages, every single time, what is the true answer pointing to? It's pointing to the man Christ Jesus, isn't it? The anointed. It's pointing to him being, it's pointing to his humanity, the man who would come of the seed every time. So you can see where their error is. Go to Psalm chapter number 2, verse number 1. We were here shortly, uh, just a moment ago. We were here for just a moment, and I want to spend a little bit more time here on something. This is, uh, this is almost baffling, what we're going to talk about here for a second. Everyone accepts, Jews accept that Psalm 2 is talking about the Messiah, the Christ. They believe that. They say this is the Christ, right? Psalm chapter number 2, the... The uh, attributes that are taught of the Messiah in the Old Testament, Jews like to focus just on one area or one half of the fulfillment of the Christ. And what is it? Him ruling and reigning, right? Well, Psalm chapter number two is the epitome of his reign on this earth, of the Messiah and the Christ ruling. There's a lot of other prophecies that are spoken of in the Messiah and the Christ, like Isaiah 53 being, you know, the, the ideal chapter, which talks about the suffering of the Messiah, the suffering servant, right? Well, Psalm 2 is really the epitome. It is really the ideal chapter of the Messiah ruling and reigning, of him being a ruler, being a governor. That's what Psalm chapter 2 is really about, him ruling the earth, ruling all the kings of the earth. And what do the Jews say? Yeah, the Messiah is going to come, and he's basically just going to take over the world, isn't he? They believe that. They believe that they're going to be ruling over all of the Gentiles. Have you ever watched, you know, little videos and confessions and stuff where I've seen where God, these, this guy in particular will go around and ask questions to all of these rabbis. And these guys say, like, yeah, you know, they're not going to necessarily be our slaves because they don't want to say that. But they're going to be serving us. We're going to be, the, you know, the head kingdom. And all the kingdoms of the earth are going to be ruling us. Yeah, because the Antichrist is going to be your head, buddy. That's what the Bible teaches. So, they, so they, they, they agree. Psalm chapter number 2, that is the Messiah. That is the Christ. That's who that's talking about. Well, look at verse number 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine the main thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Remember, that's the Messiah of Christ. That's what that means in Hebrew. Saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven, heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king, he's talking about the Messiah, upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, this is the Messiah talking, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance in the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. There's something that Muslims and Jews, who both claim, Muslims claim to believe the Old Testament, and even they think the New Testament is highly corrupted, but the Old Testament is, in, is preserved very well. I don't know if you know that or not. They think the Old Testament was preserved very, very well. It's almost, I, they may even say it's inerrant. I don't know. But I know they believe that the Old Testament is pretty much intact. But they believe that the New Testament has been highly corrupted because they reject, you know, the, 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 the 106 times it says Lord Jesus Christ, right? But they have something both in common, that they're waiting for a Messiah or a Christ, right? They're waiting for that last prophet that would be the greatest prophet of any prophet that's ever come, is what 
the Muslims will say, right? That's the Messiah that they're talking about. That's the, the Christ that they're talking about. Well, the Jews, of course, are waiting for the Messiah. They're both waiting for the Christ. But, you know, they both reject a concept strongly. Well, a conversation that Jesus had with the Jews and the Pharisees, what was the biggest beef, if you will, that they had with Jesus? Why did they actually say they crucified him? Because he said what? I'm the son of God. That was the, basically the crux of why they said we're putting this guy to death. Right? Because he said I'm the son of God. What is the mantra of the Muslims or of, the, of Islam? What is it? There's one God. His name is Allah. And what? Yeah, and Muhammad is prophet, but then they have one other statement. He has no son. That is their mantra. That is, they quote that over. If you ever see them, like, get in these big, huge, you know, like, assemblies, and they're maybe sometimes riding or whatever, they're screaming out, you know, and this is meant to be in the face of Christianity, right? And they'll just say over and over again, you know, there's one God, his name is Allah, and he has no son. But then they claim to believe the Old Testament. The Jews claim to believe the Old Testament. And in the passage that both would agree, hey, this is prophesied of the Messiah, do you know what it tells you? What or who the Messiah will be? Look one more time there at verse number 7. I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. There's no way around what the Messiah would be or who the Messiah would be. He was going to be the Son of God. This is actually spoken of one more time. Keep reading. We read verse 8. Look down at verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry with thee, and he perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Notice it's telling you to trust in the Son, too. When, when the Old Testament is extremely clear, you shouldn't be trusting in anyone. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. And who's it telling you to trust in here? The Son. Why? Because the Son is the Messiah, the anointed, who is who? He is God. Now, you cannot get around the fact that the Bible says whether you're a Jew, whether you're Muslim, I don't care if you reject the New Testament or not. The Bible teaches in the Old Testament that the Messiah was going to be the Son of God. There's no way around that. Now, people may have screwed up ideas about this now, and they may not understand what Son of God means, but even the Jews, at the time when Jesus walked on the earth, they understood what it meant for someone to be the Son of God. Jesus, when he was arguing and debating with the Jews, he said to them, you know, that he was the son of God. That was what came out of his mouth. I am the son of God. And, uh, you know, he didn't say it in that exact way. I'm not quoting him verbatim, but he taught that he was the son of God. And then the Jews respond to what he said. And then they say, thou being a man, makest thyself what? God. God. They didn't say thou being a man, makest thyself the son of God. They said, thou being a man, makest thyself God. And what did he say? I'm the son of God. The son of God is God born as a man. Here's the thing. A son, the definition of a son. The, there is no other definition of a son. The definition of a son is someone that is born. It is someone that has a birth. Now, outside of this just, this, this just retarded, you know, eternally begotten, you know, he's eternally generated idea. Everyone understands that. That a son, by definition, is one that has a birth. Or that has, you know, a, a beginning in some sense. So you know what you have just thus far already in the Old Testament? We have the teaching that there's one Lord, there's one God, there's one Jehovah. We all know that, right? A Jew, a Muslim would all agree with that. Then we have the teaching that the Messiah is going to be God. He is going to be Jehovah. He is the mighty God. He is the Lord, right? Then we have the teaching that he is also what? The Son of God. We see him referred to as the Son of God, right? Now, how does that make sense? Well, what was the definition? How did the Jews look at it? 
Thou being a man, makest thyself God. What is the Messiah? What is the Christ? What is the anointed? He's a man who comes of a particular lineage or of a seed. And who is he? He's God. Thou being a man, makest thyself God. Why? Because I said I'm what? The Son of God. That's all that it means. It's that simple. But this, this, this stupid idea of the Orthodox Trinity is what jacks everybody up on what is, you know, what, uh, what does it mean, the Son of God? He's eternally been the Son. That is, people don't realize, like, eternally begotten or eternally generated. That is a, that is a concept that is not possible. That is an oxymoronic concept, right? Eternally means not having a beginning and then generated. What does it mean for something to be generated? Exactly, to begin. So you're saying he's without beginning, beginning. What in the world? I mean, can you not understand how stupid this concept is? When the Bible says in this very passage, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Yeah. Not an eternity past. And you've got a big stinking problem when you go back to Genesis chapter number 1. And it says in Genesis chapter number 1, The evening and the morning were the first day. You know what that does? That eliminates eternity past, retard. There's your first day. So sometime after that, the son had to have been born. You know, eternally generated. You know the only time it talks about Jesus' generation? Anybody know? Matthew chapter number 1. This is the generation of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the generation of Jesus Christ. What is it? Right. His birth of Mary. Right. It's not eternally right. generated, you retard. He was generated when he came of the line of Mary. Now, he's from of old. He's from everlasting because he's Jehovah of the Old Testament. But as far as him being a son, he had a birth of a mother. Right. A son does not just eternally exist. I want you to imagine this concept of how stupid this is. Imagine a religion, right? Just a, a, a theoretical religion, not Christianity, that believes in one God who's just one person. And he's just referred to as the Son. He's a Son. But he's everlasting. He's eternal. There's not a, another person dwelling with him that he's a father. He's just a Son. What's the question? What is the definition of a Son? You have to be born. You have to have a father. How foolish is that? Right. Does that kind of make it sense? See, but here's the thing. The Orthodox Trinity is just as stupid. Because they put the Father side by side, but then they just say... He's still eternally been a son. What do you mean he's eternally been a son? Even in eternity past, who is his mother? That's what I want to know. Right. You know, when you look in the, the generations of Jesus Christ, you know what you have? You have a mother and you have a father. He had, if he's a son, he had to have a birth. You know, you can disprove this stuff from Scripture backwards and forwards. You know, and you, you may look at Isaiah chapter number 7, verse number 14 and think, why is he God with us? When it says, you know, just because it teaches that he's going to be born of a virgin. Because you're given that fact in Luke chapter number 1, verse number 35. Because it's the Holy Ghost that's the father of that child. And then the Son of God is born. He says, therefore, that holy thing, the Messiah, the Christ, the man, the Son of God, that holy thing which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. Because God fathered that child. That's why that. That's why it says that he's a vir that he's going to be born of a virgin in the Old Testament, and then it tells you he'll be God with us because God Himself fathered the child. He came down and he was born as a man. That's how it makes perfect sense. So a, a further testament to Christianity being the true religion and not just you know Judaism, which tries to claim the Old Testament, is that the New Testament explains the things from the Old Testament. That's how it makes perfect sense with Isaiah chapter number 7, verse number 14. And then on top of that, you have all of these passages teaching that he will be God himself. You know, you know further disproving the, the stupid eternal generation, eternally begotten, is that he says, this day have I begotten thee. It tells you the reason why he's called the Son of God. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. It tells you why he's called the Son of God. Then it tells you in Hebrews chapter number 1, I will be, future tense, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Yeah. Future tense. Yeah. It's done. I mean, why can't people just, just believe and receive the truth? Right. Eternal generation is not taught in the Bible. This, in Psalm chapter number 2, is a prophecy of the anointed. It is a prophecy of the man, Christ Jesus, that would come one day. That's further proven by comparing it to Psalm chapter number 45. 
where it says, thy, it says, God, thy God. The New Testament says, even thy God. God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above what? Thy fellows. Talking about a man. Go back to Psalm chapter number 2. We see what? We see the Christ, the anointed. Who is the anointed? It's the man. He's anointed above his fellows. It's so clear. Eternal generation, eternally begotten, it's stupidity. It's one of the dumbest things. It is, it is literally one of the dumbest theories or, or, or doctrines, false doctrines that has crept into true biblical Christianity. It is so stupid, it sounds so retarded, it makes you sound like, I mean, just to a, even an unsaved person, it's, it makes the Bible sound dumb. God's not the author of confusion, but you have this one person of these three persons that are God. He's God. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, He's God. And the Son, right? He's eternally been a son. You're like, well, when was he, who's his father, who's his mother? Well, you know, uh, the first person, God, is his father, right? Well, I thought he was God. They're both God. God is his father. Just blow over that. God is his father. And how, when, how long has he been his father? Eternity. Eternally. When did he father this child? It's eternity past. Eternally proceed forth from the father. What in the world are you even saying right now? Right. Who's his mother? Well, you know, she's not born yet. Okay? She'll be born in, you know, a few thousand years. So it's stupid. It makes Christianity sound dumb, man. It's foolishness. Why? Because it's it's not the Bible. It's not biblical. It's it's not found in the Bible. The son is the man that was born. Thou being a man, makest thyself God. You know what's funny about this? They understood that, number one, that when he says, I'm the son of God, the Pharisees that rejected the Jews, and look at this in light of what I'm saying right now, think of this in light of the Jews today that still reject Christianity. They understood that when he said, I'm the son of God, that I am saying, I'm God. And at that time, they had full exposure to all the scriptures in the Old Testament, right? Well, there are multitudes of scriptures like Isaiah 9, 6, Isaiah 7, 14 that teach that who? The Messiah would be God. But still in light of that, they rejected him as saying, I am the Messiah. Not only are there scores and scores of scriptures where the Old Testament teaches that he would be God, but now what do we see here? It also teaches that the Messiah would be what? The Son of God. And they counted that as blasphemy, but it would make sense. If he is saying, I'm the Messiah, who is the Messiah? He's the Son of God. But they understood that the Son of God meant that he's God. It just shows they were completely blinded at that time. Of you know, of course they're unsaved; they're blinded today. But they they didn't understand the Messiah would be God. They the the scriptures that they supposedly believed taught that the Messiah would be God. They understood when he said that I'm the Son of God, that he's saying I'm God, and then their scriptures that they claim to believe teach that the Messiah would be the Son of God. It's like what in the world? You see how like messed up all of that is? It makes it just shows they they didn't understand the Bible at all, it, you know, and still don't today, of course. Um, so, yeah, we're in Psalm chapter number 2. I want you to turn now to Proverbs chapter number 30. Here's another passage that teaches that <clears throat> Jesus would be, or the Messiah, let me say, would be the Son of God. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 4. <clears throat> That's not right. Is it 31? That's not right. Yeah, it is verse 4. It is verse 4. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrong passage, yeah. Proverbs chapter number 30, verse number 4, it says this. Who hath descended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? Imagine an Orthodox Jew. How are they going to interpret this to you? Who's talk, who is it talking about right now? God, Jehovah, right? And then it says this. What is his name? And then it says, and what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. There's no way. There's no way out of it. Jehovah has a son. There's no way out of it. There's not any way out of it. It's taught over and over again. The Messiah is the, the son. And we can see here that the son is mentioned again. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 23. Jeremiah chapter number 23, verse number 5. Jeremiah chapter number 23, verse number 5. <clears throat> One thing that I want you to keep noticing is that David's brought up. David is brought up repeatedly because that's because... The Christ, the Messiah, is prophesied to come of the line of David. Look at 
Jeremiah chapter number 23, verse number 5, it says this, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, that's the king that's going to be coming up the line of David. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That's referring to Jehovah, of course, another very clear scripture. I want you to turn to Zechariah chapter number 3. Zechariah chapter number 3. His name shall be called the Lord our righteousness, it says. Zechariah chapter number 3, verse number 8. We'll see this talked about the branch again. It says in Zechariah uh, chapter 3, verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the, the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Now, what I wanted to point out about this was in the book of Zechariah, we can see a time prophesied when the branch is going to be coming. And what line is the branch of? David, we saw from Jeremiah 23, right? This is, of course, speaking of the Messiah. And it says when he raises up that man or that branch, right? It says that he is going to remove in that day, at the very end of verse number 9, it says, I will remove the iniquity of that land, it says, in one day. Very interesting. And this is, of course, this is more in light of Christianity, uh, the New Testament, of course. Look at Zechariah chapter number 12. All the Bible is Christianity, but this is more in light of New Testament uh, scriptures looking back. Look at Zechariah chapter number 12, verse number 9. And it, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And then it says this. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now who's speaking? Jehovah. That, and he says, Jehovah says, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now, does anybody know where that is spoken of again? Someone being pierced? Psalm 22. You know what it says? They pierced my hands and my feet. Do you know who you have writing that psalm? David. The branch of David is going to be risen up. Now, very often, David writes from the perspective of what? Of Christ. That's why when the Ethiopian eunuch approached Philip, he said, is the man speaking of himself or some other man? Because sometimes people write from their perspective as though it applies to them as actually prophetic of someone to come. David, a lot of the prophecies that he would write, it would seem as if he's talking about himself, but he's actually prophesying to Christ to come, right? Well, we see the tie there with David. We see the branch being of David. Then we see here that Jehovah himself says that they're going to look upon me, whom they have pierced. Right? Whom they have pierced. Look at this, though. Grammatically, there's no way to explain this. Look, they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him. What just happened? We got a major grammatical error if we hold the Orthodox Trinity. I mean, it doesn't matter. You know, that, what this does is this, is this this really hurts a Jew. This really hurts a Muslim. This is, is just majorly damaging to somebody who wants to hold to the Catholic Orthodox Trinity. Because what you have now is one person saying me and him. Right. That's what you have. Either that or you literally have to say. I mean, you. I'm not kidding. This is your only option. You literally have to say... That God the Father, or I'm sorry, the Son, the Son, the second person of the Trinity speaks first, and he says, They shall look upon me, whom they have pierced. And then the Father steps up, and now he's speaking, and then, you know, it's not the Son any longer, he's out of the way. And then the Father says, And they shall mourn for him. Maybe why the Son's like walking away. And they shall mourn for him. That's what you have. 
The speaker didn't change. Right. right. It's because the one God in heaven became him. Right. He became Amen. man. Right. Jehovah. Right. The mighty God. Amen. That's why it says, this is an amazing mystery. It's a part of the mystery. This is what makes it so amazing. Because right. God in heaven says, at the same time, he can say, hey, they're piercing me. But while he's seated up upon the throne, at the very same moment, he says, hey, they're piercing him. They're piercing my son. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they, and they shall mourn for him. Who are they mourning for? They're mourning for the Son. Right. Mourning for the Son of God. What does this teach? This teaches that Jehovah himself will be pierced. You go to Psalm chapter number 22, which is a messianic prophecy. It's a prophecy of the Messiah to come. Everybody agrees with that, and it says that the Messiah himself will be pierced. Compare Scripture with Scripture, just the Old Testament. I don't need the New Testament. And that teaches that Jehovah himself will be pierced. There's no way around it. Right. And notice what it says after that. And they shall mourn for him. Who are they mourning for? As one mourning for his only son. Maybe only begotten son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. I'm going to have you turn to another passage here. Go to Zechariah chapter number 2, verse number 10. Zechariah chapter 2, verse number 10. So if you remember there, I'll try and hit all the passages while we're in the book of Zechariah. Here, Zechariah chapter number 2, verse number 10. If you remember in Isaiah chapter number 7, verse number 14, it's quoted in Matthew chapter 1, verse number 23. It says that his name will be God with us. So that makes sense that God is going to dwell with us because he is God himself. Look at Zechariah chapter number 2, verse number 10. It says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come... And I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. What's he say? His name will be God with us. Right. And then the Lord Jehovah says, Sing and, re and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Go to Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number 3. Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number 3. Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number 3. So, uh, of course, this is quoted. It's about John the Baptist in the New Testament. <clears throat> it says this in verse number 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Verse 4. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and, high, and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Then it says, verse 5, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. So it says, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And he's saying, make a way for the Lord, right? Prepare the way for the Lord. Look at verse number, uh, only look at verse number 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand. And then it says this. I want you to notice a few, a few uh, uh, key phrases. And his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. We know that Christ actually says that. We're going to look here in a minute. Christ is the arm of the Lord, of course. Verse 11, it says this. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm. Notice, he's feeding his flock as a shepherd. Who? Jehovah. And he is gathering his lambs with what? With his arm. Okay? Keep that thought in mind. So who is the shepherd and who is gathering the lamb? Well, the Lord is doing it and his arm is doing it. Both, right? Okay? Well, uh, just real quickly, flip over to Psalm chapter number 52. Psalm chapter number 52. Keep all those concepts in your mind. Psalm chapter number 52. At the very end of Psalm 52, it says in verse 13, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished, astonished at thee, his visage, visage his, his, his appearance, his face, was so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle the nations, the kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them, they sh uh, shall they see, and that which they had not heard, shall they consider. Notice the kings are going to shut their mouths at him. There's two elements here we can learn. He's going to be beaten because of that. He's going to be exalted at the time of his beating afterwards. There afterwards, of course, in light of the New Testament, he's exalted after that. And then the kings will shut their mouths at him. 
But they were beating him prior because his face is, is marred. Did you see the, the line of the things that are fulfilled in the New Testament, of course? Look at Isaiah 53, 1. Who hath believed our report? And then it says this, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? When we read in Isaiah 40, it said in verse 5 that the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Then he says in verse 11, he shall, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm. The verse right before that, too, says that his arm shall rule for him. Right? Uh, there in, in 53, Isaiah 53, it says the arm of the Lord shall be revealed. Well, the arm of the Lord is the glory. The arm of the Lord is he that's going to be shepherding the sheep. We're not going to spend time on this, but Isaiah 53, of course, is the passage of the suffering servant. It's prophecies of the Messiah, of the Christ. I want you to go, though, to Ezekiel chapter number 34. We're just about finished here. It's more of a Bible study this morning. Ezekiel chapter number 34. A lot of, of, of very useful scriptures that you, you will uh, bump into uh, Jews from time to time here. You'll bump into Jehovah's Witnesses. Brother Russell and I bumped into an Orthodox Jew the other day who claimed that he really believed the Old Testament. And he was trying to say, you know, that the Messiah was not going to be God that, you know, he's basically trying to uh, claim all the things that, that you've seen that the Bible clearly teaches in the Old Testament. He was trying to claim all those things weren't true. But a lot of these things are very useful for us. I want you to look here in Ezekiel chapter number 34. And keep in mind, we're, we haven't changed subjects here in the past few minutes. His arm is going to rule for him. He is going to rule. He is going to gather his flock with his arm, Right? Look at Ezekiel 34, verse 11. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. A couple of things there. Notice who's, who is searching them out and who is the shepherd? The Lord himself. As a shepherd seeketh them out, right? He's the shepherd. He says, I, even I, right? And he says, also notice this. It says he seeketh out his flock in the day. It says that he is among. He is among his sheep that are scattered. So he's among his sheep that are scattered. <clears throat> so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out. So in the same way, he will be among them, he's saying. Out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel. Keep it, who is feeding them? The Lord's feeding them. Jehovah's the one that's feeding them. <clears throat> and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture. And upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold. And in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. Who's the, sh who's the shepherd? God, the Lord, there's no way around it. Look at verse number 23. Same chapter. I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Look at this. Even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. Verse number 24. I, the Lord God, I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken to. Notice, he's as clear as day, over and over again, he says, I'm going to feed them, I'm their shepherd, I'm going to be among them, just as the shepherd's among his sheep, I, so will I be in the same exact way. Then he says in the same exact chapter, right after that, that David will feed them, that David will be there, that David, who is David? It's the branch. It's who? God with us. That's who it is. It's the Messiah coming and being born. We look back, what did Isaiah chapter number 40 say? He said, I will shepherd my sheep with what? With my arm. Why? Because it's God himself as a man living Amen. among us. Amen. We're just about finished here. Let's look at these last passages quickly. Malachi chapter number 3. Malachi chapter number 3. The last book of the Bible. We're going to kind of fly through these because I had a lot of scripture this morning. Malachi chapter number 3, verse number 1. He says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. There's no way around this. 
This is uh, obviously, you know, a parallel passage with Isaiah chapter 40. And he says, the Lord whom ye seek, even the Lord, he says, shall suddenly come to his temple. To his own temple. He's going to come. And he has somebody preparing the way for him, saying he's literally coming. Go to Zechariah chapter 14, just to show in tandem with that, that the coming of the Lord is a physical coming. Look at Zechariah chapter 14, look at verse number 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. It says in verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now look at verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the mount of of olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. It says he's going to literally stand there. It, it refers to his feet. It says his feet shall stand, and he gives you a specific location. He's going to stand there. What did um, um, where we just read Malachi three said? It says even the Lord whom we seek shall suddenly come to his temple, and he has a messenger preparing the way for him. Go to Isaiah twenty seven, real close to being finished. Here. Isaiah chapter number twenty seven. Isaiah chapter number 27, verse number 1. In that day the Lord with his sword, with I'm sorry, with his sword and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing servant, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. I want to compare this with Isaiah chapter number 11. Go over to Isaiah chapter number 11. Now notice that said that the Lord is going to be punishing the serpent, talking about Satan with his great and strong sword. Look at Isaiah chapter number 11. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his root. Remember, the branch. It's, David, it's of David. It's Jesus. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Let's just skip down. Go to verse 4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And then it says this. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. We see that being fulfilled in Isaiah 27 with the Lord smiting him with what? I'm talking about the sword of his mouth. Go to Genesis chapter number 49. We're going to compare two other scriptures and then we're finished. Now this last one is extremely interesting. Go to Genesis chapter number 49. Genesis chapter number 49, look at verse number 9. Prophecy of Judah, the seed to come of Judah. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his, his foal under the vine and his ass's colt under the choice vine. He washed, watch this closely, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth, teeth white with milk. This is considered by the Jews to be a prophecy of the Messiah who would come of the line of Judah. And notice it's specifically how he is described. How he said to look. It says that his clothes are what? He, it says he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Go to Isaiah 63, 1. Isaiah chapter 63, verse number 1. This is going to bring all of it together. Look at Isaiah chapter 63, verse number 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments? That sound familiar? From Basra, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Verse 2. Wherefore art thou led in, in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Who does this sound like? Sounds like he that was going to be born of the line of Judah, doesn't it? Look at verse 3. I have trodden the winepress alone. And of the people, 
There was none with me. There was n Notice that. There was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Who's talking? Jehovah. Jehovah God is talking. What does he look like? The prophecy in Genesis 49, even if you don't want to go to the New Testament, even if you don't believe the book of Revelation, the prophecy in Genesis 49 of the seed, the Messiah, the anointed, is fulfilled by Jehovah himself in Isaiah chapter number 63. He says, I was alone, I have the, you know, and he even specifically explains that on his garments are the blood of grapes all over his garment. And who's going to be doing that? The servant, the branch that would come of Judah. You know who it is? The mighty God of Isaiah chapter number 9. Now, keep reading real quick, two verses and we're finished. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury, it upheld me. You remember what he's saying? Who is the arm of the Lord revealed to? In Isaiah chapter number 53, he goes on to describe who? The man, the anointed, the Messiah that would come. Right before that, he called him my servant. You look in Isaiah chapter number 40, and he says, I'm going to shepherd my sheep, and I'm going to do it with my arm. Then you go and you compare it to Ezekiel 34, and you look around there, and the Lord is just emphatically clear, Jehovah, I, even I, will seek out my sheep, and I'll be among them, just as the shepherd is, in the same way. I'm going to feed them, nobody else is going to feed them, and then he says, I'm going to raise up my servant, the branch, and he's going to feed them, and he's going to shepherd them, and I'll be among them. You know why? Because he is the branch. He is the servant. He is the Messiah. His name is called what? Emmanuel. Which is being interpreted, God with us. The Messiah all throughout the Old Testament, numerous times, and I'm sure there are more scriptures than this. This is just what I could find. In Psalm 110, I found while he was reading the scripture, and I went in there and grabbed a pen real quick, I remembered, oh, Psalm 110, where it says, the Lord, Son of my Lord, and wrote that down. There are so many scriptures in the Old Testament that are about the Messiah, and so many of them prove that it is God himself coming as the Messiah, and he's doing it. He, God is doing it with his arm, the Messiah. You know what? He is the Messiah. That's why the Bible says in Acts chapter number 2, he is both Lord and Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for not sending another person, dear God, not sending you know, uh, just someone else, not sending us just a mere man, but you coming yourself and you alone getting the job done. Just help us to be more thankful for that. that help us, dear God.